I met my girlfriend Lori six years ago while working at a restaurant in Portland. She was a hostess, and I was a server traveling from Connecticut. She recently moved to the region. We were both members of the same friend circle because everyone worked at the restaurant. So naturally, we started off as friends. Now, let me take a moment to be honest about myself. While I am not flawless, I have made some blunders in my life, and I will be the first to confess that I also committed mistakes in our relationship. However, I prefer to think of myself as a good guy. Anyway, back to the story. When we were just acquaintances and colleagues, my mother was battling ovarian cancer. Unfortunately, she passed away. I have to say that even before her death, living with her illness was difficult for me, even if we didn't have the best relationship despite putting up a bright facade. I was struggling, and sex became my coping mechanism as an attractive man. It was never difficult for me to locate a mate. It was simply a method for me to get out of my thoughts and enjoy a moment with someone else while forgetting about my own life for a bit. But that is a story for another day. After my mother died, I felt as if I was losing my mind, and I desperately wanted to terminate my life. My mother had abandoned my abusive father and me when I was just four years old, so I was raised by him and my stepmother once. He remarried shortly afterward. Although my mother attempted to reintegrate into my life once, I was a teenager at the time, and we never truly healed our relationship. Losing her broke something inside of me. I felt that I never got the opportunity to talk about the things that bothered me, forgive, and get the closure I needed. I'm sharing this to provide context for my current state of mind. In the middle of my sadness after my mother's passing, I attempted to dull the pain with women. I believe I was looking for the gap she had left behind. That is how I met the lady who will become my children's mother, not the unfaithful girlfriend. To clarify, we became engaged, but our relationship ultimately dissolved due to falsehoods. I'd informed her about myself. No, I was not cheating on her. However, in my desperate endeavor to win her over, I created a false image of myself which ultimately led to our demise. Let's just say I had a sex addiction and was not completely open about it. Anyway, after the engagement ended, I went through a hard patch. Not only did I deal with depression, but I also had a continuously changing living situation and a friend from work who turned out to be deceptive. I was obliged to move from one rented room to another, never achieving stability. And it wasn't because I couldn't afford the rent. It was due of problems with the individuals I was renting from. The final straw came when the false friend threatened me with a knife over a bill. The same guy attempted to set me up with my unfaithful girlfriend, Lori. I first refused for a variety of reasons. I was still trying to work things out with my child's mother, and I wasn't very attracted to her at first. It may appear shallow, but she wasn't really my type. But Lori was one of my closest pals at the time. She was always there for me. She genuinely helped me get through the agony of losing my mother. And after my phony friend and ex-roommate threatened me with a knife over a silly bill, she let me live with her. I was going to sleep in my car anyway, and she stated she couldn't bear it. Despite my best attempts, I was unable to mend my relationship with the mother of my children over the course of several years. One is biologically mine, but the other isn't. But I stepped up to care for her eldest child as if it were my own. While I am not flawless, I am confident that I am a decent person for doing so. However, everything changed when I allowed myself to start sleeping with Lori, who had feelings for me that I did not reciprocate at first. At the time, I guess all I needed was intimacy, and I enjoyed the notion that she was interested in me. I'll be honest, despite warning her from the start that dating would harm our friendship, we ultimately got together, and my ex-fiancé found out and wasn't thrilled about it because I was also chasing her or at least making a conscious effort to improve things. Looking back, I wonder whether it was because I had given up on finding happiness in life and accepted what was offered to me. I should have tried more with my children's mother, but part of me knows she was too nice for me in the first place and did not deserve what I put her through. In retrospect, I regret ever sleeping with Lori, but I can't erase the past and have to confess that I was dealing with my own personal troubles at the time. Before I get too deep into the story, I'd like to provide some context about when things began to fall apart. It was before we were even officially a couple. Lori and I were simply friends at the time, and I was sleeping at her house after the knife incident with my phony friend. 
She was covertly dating a married co-worker from her second job as I was working to reconcile with my child's mother. Eventually, sex became involved between me and Lori, and I considered being with her. I kept wondering if she was genuine about being with me since she'd say things like, I'm just staying in Portland to see how things go between you and me. Then she'd have to stop seeing that other guy. Let's call him Joe Schmo now. She eventually became pregnant. She stated it was by Joe Schmo, but I suspect it was mine. Anyway, she had an abortion on the same day. Joe Schmo and her female buddy returned to our apartment. Her friend ended up coming into our room and cuddling with me while my girlfriend was cheating on me. But we weren't quite formal yet. Cried and sobbed on Joe's shoulder in the living room. This irritated me because I had already stated my feelings for him, despite the fact that we were not serious. Second, I had been attempting to straighten things out with my children's mother. Well, it irritated me, so I drove her friend home and we ended up hooking up for two to three hours before I left to smoke cannabis and get a little wobbly at my best friend's house. Many months later, Lori and I had moved into a new basement suite together. She had troubles with her previous roommate, and the high expense of living in Portland made it tough to locate a new place. One night, after an unremarkable shift at the restaurant, I returned to the basement suite, but discovered I didn't have a key, so I knocked on the door. I could hear sounds coming from inside, but there was no answer. I'd been beating on the door for at least twenty minutes before she arrived with my band. Tea and a small pair of black panties. Surprisingly, he wasn't that married guy. I informed her that I did not want a round in her apartment. He must have rushed to put his clothes back on, but his face was hot and sweaty, as if they had just worked hard. They didn't hear me at the door since she was playing him one of the vinyl tracks she had just purchased. Yeah, yes. There was no music playing in the suite when I knocked on the door, only the sweet, sweet sound of her cheating heart. This was the last straw. How could I possibly trust this lady again? I told her I knew precisely what they were doing because I heard it all from outside. After spending the entire day at the restaurant, I'm exhausted. Yes, the last bit was a lie but I wanted to make her feel worse than she already did. He tried to tell me that nothing had happened, and then I said, My girlfriend is standing in front of me wearing nothing but a t-shirt and panties, and she's been alone with you and inside for whatever long, and it appears you've already knocked her up. I have a hard time believing that nothing happened between the two of you. Get lost. He scurried out of there. I know what you are thinking. You weren't truly into her from the start. Love is odd. It really snuck up on me with her. I had thought of her as nothing more than a buddy, perhaps someone with whom I could occasionally get my rocks off, but she ended up taking up a warm space in my heart, which was possibly what I had been missing my entire life. I felt my shell relax, as if she were curing a part of me that needed it. But in any case, she was continuously trying to persuade me that her and his relationship had ended. After I saw them together, I couldn't get myself to believe her every time I mentioned the possibility of breaking their friendship. She would argue, You can't control who I'm friends with. This was a huge red flag for me. Men and women, in my opinion, cannot just be friends if they have had previous personal relationships. Regardless, men and women will always share an underlying urge. I stayed, and as time passed, I found myself switching jobs regularly, despite having two young children to care for, from a prior relationship. I needed a more solid profession, and working at the restaurant was not paying me enough. Not only that, but there was a lot of drama among the restaurant friends after a while. I just wanted to be far away from it. My ex-fiancé was getting married to someone else by this point, so Valerie helped me get a job at the same company she worked for. Yes, I attempted to work things out with her since I thought I had let my ex-fiancé down by not working hard enough with her. So something inside me refused to give up. Perhaps it was simply my ego. Anyway, she helped me get this position at this fancy private school where Joe Schmo also worked. But fortunately, we were on separate departments at first, so it didn't bother me too much. As long as he kept his distance from me and Lori, I'd be good. The money was too enticing to turn down. I thought things were improving. Toward the end of my first year at the new job, they shifted me to a different building. And lo and behold... My direct supervisor is none other than Joe Schmo. Great. From the start, he offered me a position that required me to work six hours a day instead of eight, but paid the same amount, knowing I needed to care for my children and wanted to see them more. 
I agreed without recognizing his hidden aims. By providing me additional hours, he wouldn't have to work them himself. At the time, I didn't consider this a warning sign because he hadn't caused any problems after I urged him to scram. I'll also admit that I didn't want to leave Lori because she provided stability for me, and I didn't want to be homeless again for my children. I had done that previously and was not going to do it again. I needed to become a better person for my children. Lori made me feel that she was trying to help me become a better person. Eventually, I felt things were improving. Lori had been all on me and very sweet, but she had not mentioned Joe Schmo or anything like that. I'll admit I did check her phone on a few of occasions, expecting to find something, but it was completely clean. But I was incorrect. One day my neighbor asked if I had another roommate. I did not. He explained that another guy had been coming by and I recognized Joe Schmo immediately based on his description. I thank my neighbor and advise him to let me know if he sees anything more unusual, but keep it quiet. I didn't say anything and tried to be as natural as possible around her and my employer, Joe. I needed to get my act together before making a move, one because I was making a nice living and needed the money for my children. Second, I wanted to ensure that I had a place to stay so that I could watch my children and invite them over without becoming homeless again. This has been a major concern of mine since the false buddy event. I just wanted to make sure I was the responsible adult my children expected. I couldn't be rash here. I began to pay closer attention to Lori and noticed subtle changes that I did not immediately recognize as red signals. She began taking calls from a different room. She kept her phone close to her and carried it to the restroom with her. A few nights later, Lori told me she's going out to drink with some of her girlfriends. I attempted to grin and urge her to have fun, even though I suspected she'd meet Schmo later that evening. I was walking my dog when I noticed a familiar SUV parked a short distance down the street from our house. The same SUV that Joe Schmo keeps in the parking lot at work. As I approached, approximately 15 to 20 feet from the vehicle's bright headlights, I spotted some persons moving around inside. Despite the darkness and my poor vision, it appears they are kissing inside. I cross the street again, this time slowing down to get a better look. They've clearly noticed me and can tell I'm angry. When I come home, I immediately reach for my phone and blow up hers. Surprisingly, she responds with irritation, accusing me of exaggerating. She informs me that her companion was simply dropping her off. She's gaslighting me, making me doubt my own understanding of events. Despite the fact that the headlights were blazing, I wasn't sure what I saw. I felt deep inside that I wasn't mistaken. I trust my instincts. As the weeks passed by... My neighbor, who shares the driver with me, informed me. He then placed up surveillance cameras in his window, one facing my front door and another looking the street from his next-door neighbor's house. This was not difficult for him because he frequently assisted the elderly man with numerous tasks. He stated he felt for me since his ex-wife cheated on him, and he understands how it feels. Several weeks passed before he reached his breaking point and decided to show me the proof he had gathered. We were sitting in his carport, smoking and talking, when he took out the proof. I don't enjoy getting involved in other people's personal affairs, but because we're friends and have spent a lot of time together here, and you've asked for my assistance, I can't ignore it any longer. As it turns out, practically every weekend since I've had my children and every other weekend, my employer, Joe Schmo, has been visiting my house while I'm still at work. He goes before I finish my shift because he is the one who creates my schedule and returns later if I leave again. They spend hours together behind closed doors, walking my dog and doing who knows what. I am outraged right now. He provides me copies of the videos. Well, I've already found an apartment close to my ex fiance and my children, but I haven't told Lori. I've also spoken with my ex-husband, who works for a high-end security company and has offered me a position there that will allow me to see my children. He's actually a pretty nice guy, and I'm very pleased for my ex and her spouse. They've been incredibly supportive of me despite everything, so, more or less, I'm satisfied with my current situation, even though Lori is cheating on me. So I take a sick day, pack my belongings, and begin transferring them into my new apartment. I had one of my mates assist me. I then take some time to send an email to my director, Joe Schmo, his boss, informing him of Schmo and Lori's relationship and making up hours on his timesheet. I quickly received a letter thanking me for this information. Lori returns home from her job and she clearly has no idea about the bomb I just set at work. But when she notices that my belongings are missing, she wonders, what's going on? 
I tell her I am leaving her. She is astonished, looking around the empty flat in astonishment. I see confusion and disbelief in her eyes, which rapidly turn into rage. She demands to know why I am going and what she did wrong. But I maintain my composure with a steady voice. I inform her that I know about her romance with Joe Schmo. Her face turns pallid. Her eyes widened as she realized she had been caught. She initially denies it, but when I provide specific details that only someone who has seen the security footage would know, knowing she's been caught, she alters her story. She claims she left, but did not do anything as awful as I did. I react with, what did I do? I did not become physical with anyone. I've never cheated on her. She is tempted to accuse me of cheating on her with my ex fiance I said, don't even start that. I say we weren't even dating. I claim she knowingly continued to see Joe Schmo after we started dating and had no idea whether it was his or mine when she had the abortion. I informed her I was leaving and was over her and her nonsense. I picked up the remainder of my bags. My dog was with my buddy as we stepped out the door. The next day I wanted to work and handed in my resignation. Fortunately, I was on excellent terms with the director and he did not ask me to stay the two weeks despite the circumstances. Update. I just received an email from our director. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. We investigated and found evidence to support your claims. Joe Schmo has been terminated, effective immediately. I attempt to remain calm, but within I'm celebrating the minor triumph. Justice has been served. Then it continues. Lori has been terminated, effective immediately. We believe it is best for everyone involved to move on from this circumstance. I've been working at this new job for a little while now, as have all of you, and I've been spending a lot of time with my children, and my ex and I have become pretty close friends. I feel good. I am happy. Wow, whoa! I hope this is a long saga. To own your shortcomings in the middle of chaos requires a certain amount of self-awareness. I mean, who hasn't battled their demons or made questionable actions in the search of happiness? Then there's Lori, the hostess turned heartbreaker, the buddy turned adversary. She was there through thick and thin, but it appears that the fine line between friendship and infidelity was too tempting to cross. Dear, Lori, a femme fatale, it's as if she's straight out of a film noir, seducing unsuspecting victims with her charm before ripping the rug out from under them. But hey, she did eventually get her comeuppance, right? Carmen has a weird way of catching up to you, especially when you're playing fast and loose with other people's hearts. But, you know, you gave her one too many second chances. And Joe Schmo, what a character. He slithered his way into both our hearts and our workplace, like a snake in the grass. Unfortunately, even the smoothest operators cannot escape the long arm of law, as proven by his quick determination. Op, Lori, and Joe Schmo's story is one of the most heartbreaking ever. Here is the next story. It's difficult for me to accept that I've connected my life to a real monster. My wife has done some nasty things. As is customary, I began to detect weird activity behind my wife, which worsened by the day until it completely flipped my life upside down. I had no idea it had gone that far. Damn it. As I was almost to work, I remembered I had forgotten my pass and wallet. I was simply lucky. Not only would I be late because I would have to go home to pick them up, but my loving wife would undoubtedly use this occasion to point out my inadequacies. My relationship with my wife, Darla, has recently become very strained. I can't recall the last time we were close. Of course, we've had a few brief meetings in recent months, but they've been far from productive. It feels like a year has passed since we had a truly awful relationship. Not only has our bedtime routine deteriorated, Darla no longer seems to enjoy anything I do or don't do. About a year ago, our life together seemed like a fairy tale. We've been married for eight years, and since our first encounter, we've felt intense love and attraction. Even with two children, Jody, six years old, and Mark, four years old, we did not waste any time. We were near at least four times every week, and I wasn't the only one who started it. Darla wanted me almost as much as I desired her. These were the days. However, things drastically changed approximately six to eight months ago. When I first attempted intimacy, she appeared to be significantly less eager. She would not refuse, but it appeared that it had become an obligation rather than something she had planned. Our intimacy and emotional connection weakened with time. I assumed it was a phase she was going through and hoped it would improve with time and attention, but it only became worse. It now feels like a reset in a tight situation. 
When I attempted to discuss the situation with her and offer aid with home activities, she became hostile, accusing me of criticizing her and regretting my lack of contribution to housework. Despite my efforts to convince her that I was eager to do more, she became even more angry, accusing me of attempting to start an argument. Last night I made another attempt to resolve the flaws in our relationship. We were in the family room with the TV on and the kids asleep. She appeared relaxed, so I started the chat. Can we speak for a moment, honey? What happens now, Jim? Her remark indicated that she expected an unpleasant conversation. We should improve on our relationship. We've been arguing non-stop recently, and I can't take much more of it. It appears that you might suspect me of cheating. Your behavior reflects this suspicion. I noted her reaction to my comments. However, rather of embracing the opportunity to establish any type of dialogue, she instantly went into attack mode. How could you say that? She replied. Our current circumstance is no different than before. You're simply starting another dispute, as usual. I'm not looking for conflict. I'm striving to figure out why we've been at odds for the past few months. I want to recognize and address what I see as an issue. Honestly, I believe we could benefit from counseling. There is no issue. The only issue is that you tend to see problems when none exist. I am tired up with your continual allegations. So, let's investigate. If there isn't a problem, why have we gone from being intimate four or five times a week to only once in the last two months? Why did I feel compelled to impose on you when you initiated intimacy nearly as frequently as I did? We used to sit on the outdoor seat watching our kids, your head resting on my shoulder and our arms wrapped around each other. Now if I walk out there, you get up and leave. You appear to be unable to tolerate being in the same room as me. Our once happy home now feels like a fight. I have no idea what you are talking about. Nothing has changed from my perspective. If anyone here requires counseling, it's you. I definitely don't need that. She rose up and stormed out of the room, leaving me with the sound of the bedroom door slamming shut. I wish I could claim her explosion startled me, but the fact is that it did not. This has become her standard reply to any attempt on my behalf to establish communication during the last few months. I sat there for a while, reflecting on the devastation my once perfect life had become. What on earth is going on, I wondered. Is she experiencing a breakdown, am I? As I considered on my earlier comment that she would accuse me of having an affair, I realized that she might be the one who is disloyal. However, everything I understood suggested that a woman having an affair would try to hide it by being overly affectionate to her betrayed boyfriend rather than responding as Darla did, which was plain angry. Unless she was retaliating for my own alleged infidelity but I believed I had addressed this when I brought it up with her. After hours of contemplation, I was no closer to a solution than before. The only decision I made was to investigate the possibilities of receiving counseling for myself in the goal of gaining insight into the situation. I made my way upstairs to bed. I felt relieved knowing that I was taking a modest step towards some kind of resolution. When I got to the bedroom, I found my toiletries and a change of clothes thrown on the floor outside, and the door was shut. Strangely, I felt relieved. The notion of sharing a cold bed with Darla didn't appeal. I retired to the guest room, undressed, and fell asleep. Last night is in the past. This morning I got up early and left the house before anyone else was awake. Normally I wake up the kids and take Mark to daycare while Darla drives Jody to school on her way to work. However, today I felt compelled to go early, so I awoke before dawn, grabbed breakfast from McDonald's, and drove to the lake to see the sunrise. It was nice to be able to do something I've always wanted to do without worrying about Dahlia's reaction or her potential rage at being left to watch the kids while I watched the sunrise. I realized Darla and I were at a crossroads in our relationship. I've resolved to emphasize my own well-being from now on, leaving Darla to care for herself, although, as her spouse, I will continue to assist her financially. She will no longer be my first priority. Instead, the kids and I will arrive first. I feel considerably lighter. I left the lake and began my commute to work. I resolved to delight in such moments more regularly and to make sure that the kids spend more time enjoying nature when driving. I reflected on my decision to seek counseling last night and concluded that it was still a great choice. As an air traffic controller, I earn a good living with outstanding perks. So financing will not be an issue. Besides, who knows? 
It might even help my relationship. It surely couldn't hurt. As I approached the control center to look for my ID, I remembered I had left my wallet and ID on the dresser in the guest bedroom. I hadn't noticed the lack of my wallet before since I kept some cash in my truck's console for convenience at drive throughs However, I now needed the ID to obtain access to work. Security precautions at air traffic control centers have increased dramatically after 9-11, so carrying my driver's license was vital, and it was in my wallet. I was frustrated for a moment, but then I remembered the resolutions I made that morning and felt better. I informed my manager that I would be taking one of my personal days off to handle some personal issues. He wasn't thrilled, but it wasn't a big deal either. I turned around and went back home. While driving, I pondered further and decided to get my ID and wallet and go out for the day doing whatever I wanted. Perhaps I'd go hiking in the mountains or ride the roller coaster at the amusement park. As I turned onto our street, I noticed an odd car in the driveway. My pleasant feelings from the morning faded briefly. However, I reasoned that it could be absolutely benign. Let us not anticipate trouble. Besides, even if it's anything terrible, I've already decided that my priority are taking care of myself and my children. Darla is responsible for her own concerns. After opening the door, I braced myself for the worst. However, I must admit that what awaited me inside put my newfound attitude to the test. I pulled up to the curb, seeing the strange car parked carelessly, blocking the entire driveway, before making my approach to the front door. When I walked in, Jody was playing a video game in the living room. Why aren't you attending school? I inquired. And where are your mother and brother? Mark was just here, Jody said. Mom is upstairs with a pal. Is it her friend's automobile outside? I inquired. I'm not sure, Dad, said Jody. All right, stay here. I will leave you off to school shortly, I reassured him, examining the kitchen and living area for Mark before heading upstairs. As I approached the top of the staircase, I heard noises coming from the master bedroom. A man's voice is followed by an exclamation of happiness. As I approached the landing, I noticed Mark. His eyes expanded with surprise. He stood beside the master bedroom's open door, his mouth gaping in awe. I ran up the stairs and along the hallway to see my son. Without a clear reason, I took out my new cell phone from my shirt pocket and took a photo of Mark as I approached him. Then another scenario in the master bedroom, when I take him up and push his face into my shoulder. I looked into the bedroom to see what had caught his attention. On our marital bed, my wife betrayed me with a stranger. What struck me most was the fact that she was still wearing her engagement ring, a sign of our broken trust. I ensured that the rings were centered in the frame. As I filmed the moment with my cell phone camera, I considered storming in and confronting them forcefully. But the notion of the two toddlers watching such a sight put me off. It was not the proper time. Furthermore, I realized that I had already reconciled my feelings for my wife, and this episode further reinforced her waning importance in my life. As a result, my first worry became securing the safety of both of my children, removing them from the situation and transporting them to a location where they would be secure from her. I quickly grabbed both kids and made my way out the door. I didn't realize Darla was watching me from the bedroom. As she turned the corner, I caught a glimpse of her in the rearview mirror as she dashed out of the house into the street. She only wore a robe. I decided to take the kids to my sister's home. From my perspective, it appeared to be a sensible decision because my sister had a 12-year-old daughter who adored my children and was ready to help her mother care for them. This arrangement alleviated the pressure on my sister who did not find it bothersome to have my children around. She truly adored them. This plan included one additional benefit. My wife was unaware that my sister and her spouse had lately moved back to town. They moved from Denver to Sacramento after he was promoted by his employer. I tried to inform Darla about this, but she disregarded it before I could elaborate, claiming she didn't care about my sister. Ironically, they used to be close friends, and it was my sister who first introduced us. When I arrived at my sister's place, I was surprised to find her absent, but her daughter Christy was present. Christy informed me that Catherine had gone to the supermarket and had decided to postpone her return to school for a week to help her mother settle into their new home. Christy, being an honor student, was well ahead of her classmates, so missing a week or two wouldn't matter much. When Catherine returned, 
I asked Christy to take my kids out to the backyard while I chatted with my sister about watching them for a few days while I handled some personal business. As my cell phone rang, I muttered a curse and turned it off. Darla called from her home phone. Catherine poured us each a cup of coffee and motioned to the kitchen table and the chairs arranged around it, saying, Please take a seat. She took a seat opposite me at the table and said, All right, spill it. Something major is clearly happening, and I'd like to know what it is. We talked for about an hour, and I told her everything about my position with my wife, my morning decisions, and recent findings at home. Catherine remained there, noticeably stunted for what seemed like several minutes. All right, I'll keep an eye on them for as long as needed. Does Darla have my phone number? And is there any chance she may come looking for them here? She inquired. Darla is unaware that you two have returned to town. I attempted to bring it up when you announced you were returning, but she cut me off claiming she didn't give a shit. Catherine was taken aback by the unexpected revelation. She and Darla had been really close when Catherine and her husband Bob lived nearby prior to Bob's promotion and relocation to Denver three years ago. Catherine expected to pick up where they left off when they returned. Darling's abrupt shift in attitude, however, crushed those aspirations, shaking her head in surprise. Catherine insisted that you also remain here. Your children require stability, and the best way to provide it is for you to be as present as possible at this difficult time. Catherine proceeded. Go hug your children. Take care of your affairs and we'll catch up later. In the interim, Christy and I will make sleeping arrangements for everyone. She then smiled and pulled me into a hug after embracing my children and Christy and expressing my love for them. I walked away, heading straight for the bank. I took half of the funds from our savings and checking accounts and opened new ones completely in my name. I checked my cell phone's voicemail and only found one from Darla. It was packed with profanity and threats, telling me of what her buddies would do if I didn't return her children right away. There was no admission of her infidelity, no apologies for her acts, only rage and accusations. I scanned the missed calls list and found no additional attempts from her. It appeared that she had made that one call out of responsibility, only to forget about it later. She had gone through the motions with little desire to do more. I'm sitting in my pickup in the parking lot. I called the numbers on my credit cards to try to close the accounts. One bank chastised me for having an outstanding balance, which surprised me given that we always paid off our cards in full each month and negotiated purchases ahead of time. However, Darla was in charge of the home money. I removed Darling's name from the account and had the outstanding charges sent to me at Kinko's. After analyzing them, I requested that the statements from the previous year be forwarded to the same location. After reviewing the comments, I was both astonished and disappointed by what I discovered. Darla had been meeting someone at various motels on a regular basis for the past six months, with at least one session per week. I also saw a troubling pattern. Initially, the motels were of higher class, such as the Marriott, and meetings were less common. However, the frequency increased over time, reaching four times in the last week, while the quality of the lodgings deteriorated to places like Motel 6 and what I assumed to be a shabby facility downtown. It occurred to me that Darla might be in financial difficulties because she was paying for these accommodations rather than having the other party pay. As a result, I began seeking legal counsel. With my grandmother's recent death and the chance of a large bequest, I contacted the estate attorney who recommended a lawyer named Ralph Edwards. I called Ralph's office and described my dilemma to the receptionist, who told me to come in immediately. She assured me that she would make time for me. Ralph's workplace was only a short distance away, so I arrived in minutes. Wow, that was quick, said Sheila, Ralph's receptionist, as she introduced herself. She informed me that Ralph was now busy with a client, but that it would only be a brief wait. Sheila showed me to my seat and handed me a cup of coffee. I accepted her offer, and as she moved to make the coffee, I couldn't help but admire her almost beautiful body in a tight skirt. She poured me a cup and, looking over her shoulder, inquired whether I preferred milk or sugar. I was so taken with her attractiveness that she had to repeat the question shyly. I replied in black, Thank you. Sheila gave me coffee, but instead of giving it to me, she bent down and placed the cup on the table next to the chair I was sitting in. She looked at me without moving, catching my gaze as I directed it down to her blouse. With tremendous effort, I averted my gaze from the scene and met her gaze. She then smiled, 
and it was a very attractive smile. Sheila's expression quickly shifted. She frowned, straightened up, turned around, and walked rapidly over to her desk, where she sat down heavily. She blushed as she glanced at me across the table and muttered, I am so sorry. It was quite unprofessional of me. I am not sure what came over me. I understand that you're going through a difficult moment, and I had no right to act like this. Please accept my sincere apologies. I finally had a good look at her, seeing more than just the physical characteristics that most men focus on. What I saw was an incredibly lovely woman. Sheila is about 32 years old. Her height is 5 feet 8 inches, and her figure is the envy of any 20-year-old male. I assessed its size as 38, 25, and 36 centimeters. She has an oval face and chocolate eyes that will captivate everyone. And beautiful nose and seductive lips are framed by a chin that adds to her character power. And to top it all off, she has lovely brown hair. As a result, an extraordinarily beautiful woman sat in front of me, a dissatisfied expression on her face and what I believed was a disarming grin. I turned to her and admitted that I was caught aback by the exhibition. You just gave a presentation. However, I'd like to clarify that I'm not shocked. In fact, I think it's rather gratifying that a woman as attractive as you would find me desirable enough to flaunt her beauty. I understand that many men in my circumstances, having recently learned their wife's infidelity, may react with disgust or want vengeance. Until lately, I would have just savored the scenery and pretended nothing had happened. Although I am passionately committed to my wife, my perspective has evolved. And earlier today, before knowing about her infidelity, I had an insight. Now I see a stunning woman that I'd like to get to know better. I understand the significance of acting gradually in order to prevent rushing into a rebound relationship and inflicting injury to myself, the other person, and my kids. As a result, instead of an apology, I'd like to request a rain check from you. I feel compelled to express this. I find you to be exceptionally lovely, and from our talk, I also believe you are clever and compassionate. My objective is to negotiate my current position with my soon-to-be ex-wife, and then I'd like to get to know you better. Your willingness to connect with me, as you expressed it, implies that we have an interest. Please do not feel obligated to react promptly. Sheila took a few moments to settle herself. She looked at me calmly, like if she was staring into my soul. She then smiled and replied, Thank you. And yeah, I would appreciate it very much. As we talked, I felt at ease in her presence. Shortly after, an intercom beep signified Ralph's request that I join him. Sheila stood and motioned for me to follow her. Unable to resist a jest, I said, I'll gladly follow you wherever you go. She grinned back, which astonished me. I noticed because I had been absorbed with admiring her presence. Sheila took me to Ralph's office before returning to her desk, leaving me with a subtle sense of loneliness during her absence. Ralph surprised everyone with his rich, booming voice reminiscent of Charlton Heston, despite his mediocre physical appearance, standing at five feet six inches and looking to weigh no more than pound 150. He appeared unimpressive, with light brown hair thinning at the crown. He gave the impression of being in his early forties. After rising from his seat to shake my hand, Ralph returned to his chair and addressed me, saying, Sheila has given me the information you told her over the phone earlier. However, I'd like it if you could look over it again in case I have any questions or if you have anything to add during the next half hour. I discussed the events of the last few months, focusing on the current day. Ralph generally listened intently until we reached the point where my son watched his mother's interaction with a friend. He inquired about the scope of Mark's and Jody's observations, as well as whether this was the first time the children had been at home while Darla hosted guests for such purposes. When I stated that I wasn't sure and indicated a desire to find out the answers to these questions, he suggested contacting Child Protective Services right away and deferring the effort of determining the answers rather than tackling it ourselves. He stated that this would result in an official report to the court rather than just an accusation from a potentially biased source. Just then, Sheila entered the office and informed Mr. Edwards. Connie Maxwell from CPS is on the line for you, before smiling and returning to her desk. Ralph grinned and said, I swear she's like a witch or something, always doing that. Connie is the one we need to talk to about this, and I'm sure she'll say she'll call me back. 
Ralph answered the phone, and for the next few minutes, I could only hear his end of the discussion. However, what I caught was intriguing. He briefly recalled the previous occurrences in my residence, as well as my interactions with the children. Apparently, Connie questioned about the kids' whereabouts, prompting me to provide him my sister's address and phone number, which he then forwarded to Connie. Throughout the interview, all I could hear were Ralph's affirmations like, Yes, okay, I will, he will, as he has taken notes. Finally, he said, I'll talk to you soon, before hanging up. Ralph then turned to me with what I can only characterize as a predatory grin, telling me you handled everything brilliantly. Connie will visit your sister's home to assess the situation and chat with them. If your wife has previously brought friends home while the kids were present, she will discover it and mention it in her report to the court. Ralph went on to say that she will also consider if your sister's residence is appropriate for the children. She could recommend foster care. According to what you have informed me about your sister's family, I doubt it will be necessary. He explained that Dahlia's actions were an example of unsuitable behavior with youngsters. He stated that if the authorities think it bad enough, Darla could be arrested and imprisoned for it. I stated that I was not very interested about whether she went to jail. My biggest worry was to ensure that my children were not exposed to such conduct. Thus, I wanted to end the marriage as soon as possible. The quickest approach to get a divorce is to consent to a no-fault divorce while ignoring the issue of maltreatment. However, if we do not include today's incidents in the case, we cannot ensure that she will stay away from the children. There's even a chance she'll get custody. And I believe that it is critical to maintain control of the situation, whether it is you or Child Protective Services. Ralph stated that with CPS in control, her access to the children must be closely restricted. Let's put off making a decision until we hear Connie's advice. I'll start the paperwork and get a temporary restraining order right away. We chatted for a few more minutes until I said goodbye. Ralph stated that he might contact me later today depending on the actions made by CPS. He promised me that Connie would keep him updated and that she would most likely contact me before reaching out to him. As I was leaving the office, Sheila approached me and said, I usually don't do this. In reality, I had never done it before. But I'd like you to know my home phone number. Please call if you have any questions or would like to discuss. She placed a post-it note into my palm before hugging me. I experienced overpowering emotions. I couldn't speak due to the intensity of my emotions. I felt conflicting feelings about hugging her tightly, expressing my passion right now, and running away. At the same time, remain in her arms endlessly. While my rational thinking informed me of the inappropriateness of such thoughts for a woman I was not married to, another part of me argued that it didn't matter because I was about to become a bachelor. In short, my mind was in chaos, and I was being tugged in multiple ways at the same time. Sheila took a step back and glanced at me with a horrified expression. She started to apologize, stammering. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to be so nasty. I simply wanted to tell you that we are here for you at this difficult moment. I didn't want it, despite being overcome with emotion and rendered mute for a moment. I found the resolve to gently place my index finger over her lips, drowning out her apology. With a smile, I expressed my gratitude. I'm having trouble expressing how I feel. Wow, I am at a loss for words, but thank you. I will definitely call just to hear your beautiful voice. Despite the hectic pace of events, I recognized my capacity to handle pressure, particularly in flight crises, and took comfort in the prospect of reaching out to her as I pondered on our newfound connection. I couldn't help but wish for more than friendship. Sheila responded by kissing my finger and playfully urging me to call as if it were a command. With a smile, I agreed. Your wish is my order. We laughed together before saying our goodbyes. I walked towards my pickup and she walked towards her desk. I was traveling to my sister's house when I got a call on my phone. Connie informed me that she was on her way to see my children at my sister's place. She asked me to notify my sister about her coming and requested permission to talk with the children. She stated that she could legally compel the talk if required, but it would be a longer procedure involving a court order. I verbally consented to her request and informed her that I was on my way to meet her. When I arrived at my sister's house, I noticed a woman, whom I assumed was Connie, speaking with her on the front porch. They both turned to greet me as I pulled up and approached them. 
After exchanging greetings, Catherine explained that Connie had briefed her on the upcoming meeting and that she planned to speak with the kids individually unless they felt uncomfortable without us. Connie then addressed me, saying, Jim, I'll need you to sign a release allowing me to speak with the kids. It's only a legal requirement, but it speeds up the procedure. Instead of getting a court order, I told her that it would not be an issue. When I entered the house, both of my children ran to welcome me, joyfully telling me about their activities with Christy. I looked up and saw Connie smiling at us, comforting me that everything would be fine. I proceeded to introduce the children to Connie, assuring them that she only wanted to talk to them and that everything was fine. I underlined that kids could tell her about anything. She asked Jody with a somber face, Will she ask about Mommy and her associates? She was able to instill a negative connotation in the word friends. I reassured her that the talk would most likely include Mommy and her friends. Jody replied assertively, Good. I told Mommy that I didn't agree with what she was doing, but she disregarded me, claiming it wasn't my responsibility. Connie spent about an hour talking with the kids before making a phone call while they were playing in the backyard. Then she motioned for Catherine and me to join her outside. First and foremost, Jim, I'd like to praise you on raising two great children, Connie began. They definitely admire and appreciate you. Despite being aware of the misconduct, they chose silence to protect you. It's clear they adore their mother, yet they have no regard for her. In fact, they were both very unhappy with her and anxious to air their problems with me. Frankly, what I discovered was unpleasant, Connie clarified. It appears that your wife invited strange men to Wade's house and had fun with them while the children were left unsupervised. It appears that she did not ensure that the children attended school on a regular basis, which explains why she frequently missed courses. When I contacted the school, I discovered that they planned to transfer the case to us because to the children's recurrent absenteeism, and Darla's answers appeared suspicious. The headmistress stated that she had a talk with Darla yesterday and was disappointed with the responses she received. As it turned out, the referral had already been received, so Connie contacted a social worker and accepted responsibility for the case. Connie claimed that something dreadful had occurred to him. One of Darley's partners attempted to harm Jody, but Darla did not intervene. According to Jody, it occurred yesterday. You chose the ideal moment since the man you saw in bed with Darla is the one who attempted to harm Jody. After hearing this, I felt compelled to leave, return home, and confront the matter head on. If I owned a firearm, I would use it without hesitation or remorse. Catherine and Connie helped me calm down. And, as Connie noted, it appears that yesterday was the first incidence, and Jody appears to be handling it well. I feel she might benefit from some counseling, but it should not be substantial. In reality, this incident will greatly benefit your divorce case. Darla will have a slim chance of obtaining shared custody and may face jail time or probation. Connie continued, I contacted the district attorney's office, and they will be preparing charges to present to the judge. Unless I am mistaken, the police will most likely arrive at your place late this afternoon with a warrant for Darley's arrest. I spent the afternoon at Catherine's, discussing the day's events and the circumstances that led up to them. Later, I got a call from Detective Saunders of the local police department. He informed me that the court had issued a warrant for my wife and requested that I follow him and a few other officers to my home. He advised that I allow them entry into the house and identify Darla for them. When I arrived at the house, I noticed that the street was jam-packed with unfamiliar automobiles and trucks. I could hear loud music and what seemed like a wild party coming from within. After about two minutes, six police cars arrived, two of which blocked the roadway at both ends, and a plainclothes officer approached me asking whether I was Jim. I replied affirmatively to him, I'm Detective Sergeant Saunders, but please call me Doug, he explained. We've already had multiple complaints about the volume during this party. A squad car arrived 15 minutes ago and asked for the noise to be lowered. I can't help but wonder whether this has occurred before. If not, explain what she did with the children. And, if it had happened before, why hadn't the neighbors complained to me? Perhaps she believed she could have a celebration now that you had taken the kids. Doug advised that a uniformed officer approach him and inform him that everyone was in position. Doug requested if he, I, and another plainclothes cop could do a preliminary search before bringing in the uniformed officers. 
He feared that the sight of uniforms would startle many partygoers, so he wanted to find the proper time. I agreed, and we walked to the front door, entering the house that had been my home until a few hours before. We found two men in the foyer sitting on dining room chairs and a tiny table. A huge jar sat between them. The jar was full of money. Gentlemen, the younger of them, spoke incoherently, definitely inebriated. He held a bottle of my favorite 21-year-old single malt whiskey in his palm. The hostess of the house had a difficult day. Her spouse found her in bed with her boyfriend. He removed the children and most likely will not return. So she needs money. As a result, the cost of a leisure activity has risen. If you want full entry to the party, you must deposit $150 in the donation box. He went on to say that anyone who only wanted to have fun without participating in a group meeting might donate $1.50. Doug noted that this jug seemed to be pretty full. It's frightening to consider how many there are already. The inebriated man responded, Well, she enjoys gatherings like this, and tonight she plans to set a new record. In less than two hours, she had already held 34 meetings. If you don't like it, a couple of her buddies are already here and another two are on their way. I asked if she was interested in group activities. How often does this occur? He said, This is the fourth meeting I have attended, and I've heard that she's taken part in several others, generally in small groups. Her husband's schedule is unpredictable, so the times and locations are constantly shifting. I see, I admitted. What was her fee prior to the latest price increase? She did not have a set fee. Just what you'd like to add. When I reached into my pocket and threw a quarter into the jar, the intoxicated man seemed surprised. Our friend entered, stood between us in the home, presented his badge, and calmly led us out the front door, where two uniformed police officers greeted us. We strolled into the living room and saw Katie, the neighborhood's famous hostess, who lived just two doors down. She appeared to be in a compromising situation, which made me wonder how her husband, the pastor of our Baptist church, would react if he saw tomorrow's headlines. The minister's wife was arrested. Doug looked at me with a puzzled expression, quietly querying, Is this her? I simply shook my head as we made our way to the stairs, leaving Katie and her companions to handle their affairs. I suspected. Doug believed that if the situation worsened, the uniformed officers stationed at the door would capture them if they tried to run. We went a bit further and stepped out into the yard where my wife was in an extremely disadvantageous position. She quickly noticed me. Hey, everyone, say hello to my husband. She yelled, do you want to get in on the action, honey? I'll even allow you to cut the line. After all, we are married. She looked to the males in line and said, do you mind if I let my dear, ever-loving husband cut in front of you? Right? Do not worry. It will not take him long. She looked at me again. But first, I'd like you to return my kids, my pals, Ted and Joe. She pointed to two burly men standing near the barbecue. If you don't, I'll knock the crap out of you. Ted and Joe turned to face me, puffing out their chests to appear tough and intimidating. At least, I believe I was supposed to feel afraid. I almost regretted not having my military mates with me. I wanted to test how much I remembered from my time with the Army Rangers. I was confident that I could handle them without much issue. They did not educate me to fight fairly. Doug. I turned, amid the sounds of catcalls from party-goers, and we made our way to the entrance door, walking outside. I turned to Doug and said, Kid, do you need me right now? Doug told me I could wait by the entry, but he wanted me to stay until everyone had left so I could lock the house. Doug assembled his officers and briefed them. Then they blocked all exits, and Doug and around ten uniformed officers returned to the residence. Chaos ensued. I sat on the hood of a police car, watching as people surged towards the facade. Windows glanced outside and vanished. I heard yells and screams coming from inside the house. Several persons attempted to flee through the front entrance, but were apprehended by the police. I saw Joe appealing with the police officer to let him go because he had a wife and children at home and did not want them to be embarrassed by the news because he was a respected figure in the town. Joe unsuccessfully argued with the cop. A mobile news van from the local TV station arrived and began recording, with the first person caught on video being. As you could have imagined, Joe, it served him well. 
If he had simply kept silent and gotten inside the van, his photo would not have aired on the 10 o'clock news. It didn't take long before the final few folks were hauled out. The last two are my wife, Katie, and the priest's wife. A group of neighbors had come to watch, and when Katie was carried out, everyone gasped. Many of these folks attended her husband's church and were taken aback when she was escorted into the paddy wagon wearing just a blanket. Steve Bauer, my neighbor from across the street and a gossip worse than any ten ladies, noticed me sitting on the bonnet of a police car and approached. What's happening? It is a raid, I told him, barely holding back. Laughter. Are they arresting those individuals? Yes, I believe they are being arrested. What charges will they face? I believe you should ask the police this question, but I'm confident that the girls will be charged for behaviors that are absolutely unacceptable in our culture. I told Steve, and he hurried to inform the other neighbors, as Darlo was being let out. She recognized me and managed to get away from the cop who was escorting her to the vehicle. She rushed up to me, which was a mistake, because the blanket had slipped off and her hands were chained behind her back. She stood in front of me, head lowered and crying. Jim, please? It was simply a huge error. It should not have spiraled out of control like this. Please inform the police that everything is all right and release me. Darla, the issue may have spiraled out of control, but given that I only left this morning, you surely pulled everything together in a fast. So I can only deduce that this isn't the first time everything was overly planned for the occasion. I may be fresh here, but this was not your first time. Not to add that I can't just tell the police to forget about it. They will not do it, no matter what I attempt, and I will not. Don't bother asking. I will not bail you out. Before she could add anything else. The officer who was escorting her raced up to her with a blanket, wrapped her in it, dragged her to the van, dug, approached, and informed me that the home had been cleared, allowing me to secure it. He suggested that I hire someone to clean it before moving back in. I agreed. We locked up and decided to leave it until the next day. In the morning, I want to phone a locksmith to change the locks and schedule cleaning services. Doug promised me that the patrol cops would monitor the property overnight in case any intruders approached. After locking up, I went to my sister's apartment. Looking at the clock in my truck, I was astonished to discover that it was only 715. So much had happened that day. It felt incredibly early. Upon arrival at my sister's, I spotted a picnic taking place in the backyard. To my astonishment, Sheila sat on the glider, chatting with my sister, while Jody relaxed in her lap, seeming very pleased. Sheila noticed me approaching and was astonished. However, police said, but she stayed mute until Catherine introduced us. Jim, meet Sheila, my next-door neighbor. Sheila, this is Jim, my older brother. As I stretched out to shake her hand and bowed, we both burst out laughing, leaving Catherine stunned, puzzled, and ultimately thrilled. Turning to Catherine, Sheila mentioned that Jim is actually my boss's attorney. We met today at my office, and I virtually hurled myself at him, dragging him into an empty room. Remember your maiden name? I wasn't wholly surprised when he walked through the gate. Your description of the children had me convinced it was the same person. Is this the sibling you attempted to introduce me to back in college? The one I declined to meet because I was obsessed with the loser. Cheater? I ended up marrying Catherine, she chuckled. Yes, he's my only brother. Do you remember when you turned him down? I introduced him to Darla. Do you know how that turned out? She. Sheila's attitude became serious as she addressed me, adding, Jim, I understand you're going through a difficult time right now. You might think that being married to Darla was the worst thing ever, but you have two wonderful children who adore you. They will look to you for advice, so don't forget it, okay? I will not forget. Knowing they rely on me has helped me get through today. I know they need their father, especially because their mother may not be present much. I adore my children and will do anything to raise them well. Sheila smiled at me. I know you will, and I'll be there to help in any way I can. She shifted on the swing, causing Jody, who was nearly asleep, to awaken. Sheila calmed her with a soft tickle and a kiss on the forehead. Jody calmed down, and Sheila indicated for me to sit near her. I sat down and threw my arm across her shoulder. She quickly sank into my chest, reaching up to grab my wrist and moving my arm around here, emitting a happy moan. Catherine noticed us. It appears that you two had known each other before today. 
I know that sounds ridiculous, but we actually just met. Sheila commented that it feels like we've known one other forever. I know it's too soon for Jim to be looking for another relationship, but I can't stop myself from wanting to be with him like this. I just want to be close to him and touch him. I hope he feels the same way. She cocked her head back and looked into my eyes with a hopeful smile. I leaned in and gave her a delicate kiss on the lips, which was meant to be light, but rapidly escalated into something more. Sheila withdrew and looked up at me. Wow. Perhaps we should avoid similar behavior when others are present. We may wind up embarrassing them. Seriously, Jim, I understand that you are only getting started on a road with unpredictable outcomes. It would be unwise for you to jump into a relationship, especially since you are still legally married. But I want you to know that when you're ready, I'll be here hoping you'll choose me. Mark went onto my lap, finding space next to Sheila, and snuggled up to both of us, sighing as he fell asleep. I believe you're both a hit, I commented. You two are also big hits with me. Until now, I did not believe in love at first sight, but now I do. Do you recall what Patrick Swayze told Demi Moore in Ghost? I asked. No. What exactly did he say? Ditto. Her smile brightened her face, and I knew I would do everything to see it again, reflecting on an old John Denver song. Some days are diamonds, while other days are stones. Today I see it incorporated both. The stone symbolized the end of my marriage to Darla. Even now I am unsure why she took the path she did. The diamond represents my new relationship with Sheila, and I'm not sure where it will lead. I have a strong feeling that I will love the journey. Later, I recognized that hiring Ralph Edwards as my lawyer was the right move. He had the necessary connections to get things along efficiently. Darla may have stayed free for up to a week before being apprehended if Ralph and Connie had not intervened. However, she spent more than one night in jail. I'm not sure of Ralph's involvement, but Darla struggled to get bail. No bail bondsman was willing to assist her, and I had no desire to help her. As a result, she stayed detained until her lengthy trial. Darla was convicted of criminal child endangerment and given probation, which she violated. We never heard from her again, and I never learned the cause for her disappearance. Thank you for taking time to hear today's story. If you loved this story, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to tell about your or someone else's circumstance, please don't hesitate to contact me. Take care.